you be a disciple, you, you pray, you stay close to God, and you will know God's will. The greatest thing we can do is to do God's will. Yeah. And that's gonna look different for all of us. Jackie Angel is a full-time international speaker, singer, songwriter, and worship leader. She has been published and speaks to worldwide audiences on Catholic marriage, discernment, and theology of the body. She also contributes regularly on the Ascension Presents YouTube channel. Listen in as we discuss reaching young people today, gender, discernment, and recognizing the movements of the Holy Spirit in your life. Benedictine College is transforming culture in America, one conversation at a time. From our studios in Atchison, Kansas, these are the Benedictine Dialogues. All right, Jackie Angel, welcome to Benedictine Dialogues. Thank you. Yeah, good to have you here. So some of the big news lately is you just had recently had another baby, right? Yes, whose name is Benedict, by the way. <laughs> so very appropriate. <laughs> perfect, perfect for the show, yeah. yeah. Do you ever think about, you, like, you literally bring angels into the world? Is that something that... Uh, I know, I'm through? like, we are angels, not metaphysically, but yes, we are. <laughs> well, what's cool, so his name is, when Pope Benedict died, mm -hmm. I said, Bobby, we could name this one Benedict and mm -hmm. call him Benny, because all of our names, have, nicknames have, you know, Bobby, Jackie, Ben, you know. Um, and it kind of just, because we love Pope Benedict, yeah. and, and we actually got to go to Rome a couple months in to celebrate our 10-year anniversary oh, and wow. go to his tomb. It was so beautiful. It was so We love Pope Benedict. And, um, and then it just stuck because my kids started calling the baby Benny. They're like, hi, That's Benny. Awesome. So I was like, okay, I guess. And Benedict means good word, literally, yeah. or it means blessing. Um, his middle name is David. He's named after both of our dads are David. And then our last name's Angel. So David is beloved, Benedict's good word, and Angel means messenger. So his name literally means the beloved messenger of the good word. Wow. So like, you gave birth to a prophet. Yeah. You, you better be doing some stuff with your life. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And you're, you're here at the college uh, working with Casting Nets yeah. uh, for their training camp. And so maybe you tell us a little yeah. bit about what's going on there. Yeah. Every year they do. And this is, I, I, I've been with them since the beginning. They do an evangelization camp, training camp for high school students, nice. kind of high school, more junior seniors in high school. And just teaching them, like, how do you share your testimony? Um, like, how do you evangelize in the culture today? And so um, me and quite a few other speakers, we kind of just share our, our own stories. We share church teaching and just how to evangelize in all different ways to all different types of people. That's cool. And give them the tools to do that. Yeah, yeah. and that happens every year here at Benedictine College, yep. right? Yeah, yep. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about, I know you've been working with high school students, college students for, for some time. I'm sure you've seen how the culture has shifted over time, especially, I mean, gosh, I mean, it seems like every year something else is changing yep, yep. lately. Um, and so something I know that you've worked with a lot is especially young women, you yep. know. Um, what are some of the challenges that they're kind of currently facing and, and what are you seeing in the kind of current milieu, if you will, right. with when it comes to females coming up in this world? Yeah, so the the deep things always kind of stay the same in the sense that young women were always like, you know, asking the questions. We all have wounds of like, am I good enough? Mm -hmm. Or am I too much? Am I this? You know, we all have, the wounds are always the same, the shame, the rejection, the, the, and this is just hum, being a human person, mm -hmm. right? But then you have the, the culture that's changing mm -hmm. and how that comes out. So even if people dealt with those same wounds of rejection or shame or hopelessness or just whatever it is, they maybe had a culture that was more supportive of how to cope with those things, yeah. right? So how, like how you cope with prayer, having good friendships. Um, like my sister, who's not really practicing her face, sent me like a sheet of like healthy coping mechanisms and unhealthy, like unhealthy is like alcoholism, yeah. like eating your feelings, like not like stuffing everything deep down. Good coping is like prayer talking to somebody about it, you know, stuff like that. And I realized like, ah, in our culture, the way we cope with things is not great. In the sense that now we have things like, um, we don't even know how to make friends anymore. Yeah. That's a huge thing that um, in college, in high school, especially with COVID, there have been years out of some kids' lives that have been on Zoom yeah. and they were not in person. And so now we're hearing like, there's right now in high school and college, like there's a whole grade of leaders that are just gone. Mm. And kind of like, I don't know how to make a friend. So that's one thing. And that's so important for coping with difficult things is having friends, having good friends that you can talk to. And if you don't even know how to make a friend, that's difficult. Um, and obviously this generation is, I, I was reading a study that said it, they're the most anxious, lonely, and depressed generation ever. And so the, the way we cope with that is like 
spend time on social media. You almost yep. escape reality. And now, not just social media, but now we're finding more ways to escape reality, mm -hmm. whatever that is, whether it's gaming. And there's nothing, obviously, my book, my husband just wrote a book about right. <laughs> video games and how you can find God in video games. But just even me, I can escape mm -hmm. by just scrolling on Instagram or on Twitter. I can escape by playing games on my phone. And um, so I feel like the ways that we cope now and that young young women can mm -hmm. cope or like now the temptation like OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. Like you never had that before. And now we have things like that that it's like, oh, Lord. But I think even just at the very basic level, not being able to make friends and not yeah. having good friends that's like very important to formation as disciples and also just how do we even deal with basic things that we're going through, really difficult things. So, and then the other thing I'm seeing is because the culture is going so far when it comes to the transgender movement, when it, we don't even know what male and female is. And actually the whole transgender movement is based on this very um, stereotypical vision of male and female. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When, when you have the opposite backlash, now you have women being told, like, this is what it looks like to be woman, mm -hmm. Tra the trad wife movement, mm -hmm. which is like, oh, my gosh, it's so damaging in the sense, that, like, that's not, like, being a woman is much different, like, when it comes to, it's more about virtue than it is about, like, here are the externals, like, you need to be the perfect trad wife, and you need to look like this, and it's like, no, you need to be who God created you to be. Mm -hmm. Because if that trad wife movement was around with Joan of Arc, we'd be in trouble. You know what I'm saying? Or like, you look like St. Gianna Beretta Mola, who was a doctor. And anyways, um, it's, it's very interesting to see when the culture goes this way, sometimes we overcorrect mm -hmm. and go really far. And then and these young women are hearing, I mean, I'm seeing the, this growth of influencers who are, if you aren't a stay-at-home mom, you're bad, you know? Mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if you don't wear just like what we look like, if you don't go back to the 1950s housewife, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very interesting. And I'm like, this is not the truth, yeah. um, but you're not, you need to just be who God is calling you to be. Yeah. And it's gonna look different for every man, for every woman, and the gifts that we've been given. So that's the other kind of voice that I've been seeing in the culture. And it's, it's interesting. It's like, no, there needs to be a middle yeah. the middle way. Yeah, it seems like there's a, a constant narrowing of what we mean by man and woman yes. on both sides, right? Yeah. So on the transgender side, you have these narrowings of if you like sports, if you like to be rough and tumble, right. it means you must be this. And right. it's like, no, that's such a narrowing understanding. So what, yep. one thing I always try to talk about is like, look at the Hall of Saints, right? Look at yep. the, all yep. the varying, dis, you know, very, very different personalities that are involved mm -hmm. in that. And so you can find yourself in your authentic femininity, your authentic masculinity in one of these figures that are far different. I mean, right. if I think on the male side of things, you've got St. Francis of Assisi, and then you have like Don Juan of Austria, who was a crusader, right? I mean, right. very different things. Like you yeah. said, Joan of Arc or Teresa of the Sioux, these are very different ways of expressing. Right. And it seems to me like that actually feeds also into the issue with, I think, friends, because sometimes we have become so disembodied by because we stereotype or because we put ourselves in these narrow categories yeah. that that shyness that maybe was barely there turns into an actual full on disembodiedness where like, I don't even know how to talk to you face to face because I'd rather text you, right? right? Yeah. Because <laughs> I feel safer maybe yeah. in, in that place. So, yeah, and I think let's, let's dig a little deeper into that issue of, of how Christians are reacting to some of these things because I think in regard to, I always think of John Paul II's work on authentic femininity, and mm -hmm. I don't think this would be his, his answer. Um, but then I also recently watched the documentary Shiny Happy People. I don't know if you've seen that oh, yet. Oh, is that the, yeah. Uh, about the, Doug, the, the Duggar the family Duggars, and the whole yeah. Gothard thing. And so sometimes the language sounds really similar <laughs> that's mm -hmm. coming out of that world. So what is the, not, not necessarily what's always the proper reaction, but maybe the proper understanding of when people say things like feminism, which does have some issues with it, granted, I think right. there's some good in there too, versus an authentic femininity, right? I think those right. two things are similar, but, but different in degree, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's a beauty in that men and women are different, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, when we start stereotyping like, oh, if you like dolls, you must be a girl. It's like, no, I, I know girls who, you know, I, I, it's funny, I read um, like testimonies of women who are like, thank God this wasn't around when I was young because I was a tomboy mm -hmm. and I loved hunting and fishing and I just loved sports or I was a jock and I would have been told like, oh, well, you must be a boy and have this surgery. It's like, no, you can love all those things and just be an awesome woman. Exactly. And actually, Bobby and I were just re-watching um, 
we were watching John Adams, you know, oh, for uh, yeah, right, yeah. and watching like Abigail Adams, like mm. that. The stay-at-home nineteen fifties didn't like that was very back in the day when you had a farm and you had, your husband went off. You worked the farm. I mean, there was so much work you did, and and she was so brilliant and, and intellectual, and it's so beautiful to see their relationship. But um, you, what you just said about that narrowing of male and female, like femininity. The, the fact that we can create life and we are different is so beautiful. It's such a gift that we can bear life. We can do something men cannot do or can never do, even even as much as science wants to try to get men to do it. Um, and, and that's the beauty of how we are made in our bodies is that we can bear life. And so there are, there, there are ways that we complement each other and that virtues that naturally women are more inclined to but the whole goal is that we learn from each other, mm -hmm. right? So um, I I have a tenderness. I mean, my husband really does too. But like I, I never was um, great with kids. Like I never babysat. I was the youngest, so I didn't mm -hmm. have younger sure. siblings. But having a baby, my first child, it was so natural to me. Yeah. Like it just. I didn't, I was like, I don't necessarily want a lot of children. Now I have five children, of course, in <laughs> ten years. Um, and and so like I didn't know how to be a mother, but like, it was amazing the instinct that came in of being a mom. Mm -hmm. And, but Bobby, I was like, okay, here's how you hold, he didn't have like a lot of younger siblings, he never babysat, you know? And so I was like, here's how you hold a baby, you yeah, know, cause for yeah. him it was kind of awkward at first. <laughs> but the the instinctual things that came from me, um, like I'm able to teach him and like we're, we're learning constantly from each other because as men and women, we compliment each other. Now my other thing too is I think because, um, Jesus was is the lion and the lamb. Mm -hmm. I think men and women, if we are disciples of Jesus, if we are Christians and we are supposed to be like little Christ, we all have the lion and the lamb mm -hmm. within us. So when I see this like hyper alpha male movement and and there's things obviously we can agree with, sure. like, right? Like the discipline of, you know, self-discipline and all that stuff. Um, and then I see like this hyper masculinity and then this like interesting trad wife movement. Um, I'm thinking okay, we're all called to be disciples. We're all called to be the lion and the lamb. Mm -hmm. So there's parts of me, I'm a strong woman. And I knew when I married like a man, I was like, he has to be strong. He, he can't be intimidated by me because mm -hmm. I've dated guys like that and I have emasculated them mm -hmm. and that does not work well. So I was like, I need a man who's has a strength, but maybe more introverted, you know, sure. <laughs> like I'm maybe not as extroverted as I am. And Bobby was such a good, he's like, perfect for me in the sense that he is a strong, he's a strength, but he's so tender. He is a lion and the lamb. And, and then I, me as a woman, I'm, I'm a strong woman, but I am very tender and with my children and I'm teaching Bobby. He's teaching me in certain ways, um, tenderness and other ways that I'm impatient and that I get angry and, he, and I'm teaching him. And so that, that's the beauty of when you don't, um, you don't have such a myopic view mm -hmm. of male and female. Mm -hmm is that you can have men who are very tender and who have grown up maybe being the oldest of a family and they know how to be, they are very good with babies and kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I have guy friends like that who are the oldest of 11 and they are such good dads because they grew up taking care of their siblings. And, yes. um, and then I know women who have such a beautiful strength and it doesn't have to mean like, oh, you're that's bad. It's like, no, that's how God created you and it's beautiful. And with Pope John Paul, he, he focuses so much on the the, the virtues mm -hmm. versus like you have to stay at home, you have to wear this kind of outfit, you have to do this and this. And he's like, he doesn't say that. He's like, women are such a beautiful part of, obviously like a very necessary, beautiful part of humanity. And this is what the virtues that they give this beautiful tenderness and this um, just even the way our bodies are made to like, to how we shelter like our arms like you know just it's it's beautiful and i think we really limit people when we just focus on the external trappings yes like oh men you just have to be like buff and strong and that's great um and i, I think of one influencer who i you know is buff and strong and it's all about being successful and, and working out but then when it comes to women mm -hmm. and how he treats women he has no problem being kind of a womanizer Using, yeah. Yeah. and i'm like okay, if you have self-control in all these other areas, but you don't have self-control in your sexuality, that's really just a pharisaical, and he's not even, he's a secular. Sure. It's like, that's almost just what the Pharisee, it was all about the externals and not about the inside. Yeah. And so when we focus so much on this outward appearance versus like 
the inward person, the virtue, I was like, then it's just a, it's a front. It's yeah. a fake, you know, for not really working on this. Yeah. 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 And it's, and it's hard because like, as you said, there are some things that it is proper to react against, which yeah. ultimately the, but, but not by committing the same errors. Right. Exactly. So one of the issues exactly. that I have with uh, certain trends in feminism is you end up masculinizing the idea of being a woman. It's like, mm. well, wait, let's just feminize it to its greatest degree. Why do right. we have to turn you into a man in order to make you a wonderful woman? That doesn't make any sense. No. I mean, no, not you, at all. you know my wife and she's no shrinking violet. No, <laughs> she's very much she's a awesome. firecracker. Yeah, she's a firecracker. Um, and doesn't take anything from anybody. Um, yeah. And I love that. You know, that's yeah. something that we, we work with each other on that. And so I think that what we end up doing is narrowing through our reactions versus, and I, this is kind of coming from my background in Russell Kirk. One of the things that he always hated was abstractions. So I'm coming up with this idea of the perfect thing. So mm. society or economics or whatever, versus I'm looking at the reality of what you are, what society is. Yep. And now how do we extrapolate what's perfect in that and then yeah. build off of that. So rather than trying to say, I have to dress this way, I have to act this way. It's like, well, no, God puts certain charisms in you, certain actions in you that are beautiful and you need to express those in your highest degree. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you need to flip flop into these stereotypes, yeah. just be who you are, you know? And that to me is the, what John Paul II was trying to say through all this yeah. is like, find those places in you, which is why disembodiedness is so dangerous because yep. that's where you find it is, is in your actions and how you deal with one another. To bring up Bruce Lee, he always said, I find out myself when I deal with other people, right? Because I'm always, and John Paul II said the exact same thing. And John <laughs> so Paul and Bruce Lee, I can only, we can only find ourselves in being a sincere gift exactly. to yourself. And Bruce exactly. Lee, man, the prophet, the prophet Bruce Lee. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So to me, yeah. what, what you end up doing is creating, and, and I, I want to get into kind of the issues of the dating pool these days, because you end up creating those stereotypes mm. along with all these abstractions that you have in social media and the reactions against certain things. And now trying to date in that <laughs> oh, sort of like blender of reality, yeah. what does that even look like? And like what? God bless <laughs> what it. Oh, have? my yeah. poor friends. My poor friends who are still single and sure. like trying to go in the dating pool. It's rough. It's really rough. Well, yeah. you think like in the past when it came to virtue, the culture was much more on the same page when it mm -hmm. came to virtue, like maybe waiting till marriage to have sex. Like th there were just things that were more in common with more people. Mm -hmm. And now like I think it's like, okay, like just taking that being a Catholic woman who is Catholic, you're like, okay, I don't want to use contraception. So 99% of the world doesn't agree with that, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, okay, I'm looking for a 1% of the people. I mean, like 99, apparently 99% of women use contraception. Jeez. So you're like a 1% already when you say that statement. And then you're like, and I want to live a life of virtue. I want to marry somebody who's going to help. We're going to go to heaven, like lead mm -hmm. each other to heaven. And then you just even have in the Catholic faith, the divisions of like litur the liturgy wars. Yeah. And you have different things of like, oh my gosh, it's... It is really, really tough. Now, I will say, to give encouragement to anyone who is out there listening, it only takes one person, okay? Like, you're not marrying 10 people, I, yeah. don't, I don't think. I mean, unless you're like the woman in the Gospels who like her brother, and he died, and she married his yeah. brother, you know? Um, but it only takes one, right? It only takes one. And I have met some women. Actually, a woman came up to me this year, and she's like, she was 60. She's like, I just got married for the first time, wow. and I'm 60. And... She's like, I'm, and it was all worth waiting for. And waiting on God's timing, mm. because the other option, and I hear people give the advice of Mary Young. Mm. Now, that is in reaction to the feminist movement. Sure. It's like, work, work, and then get married when you're after, when you're ready at 40, 30, late in your late 30s. And I don't agree with, I was like, my take is, you do God's will. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved to marry Bobby when I was 20, mm -hmm. but I didn't meet him till I was 27 and we got married, maybe 28, and I, we got married at 29. Mm -hmm. That wasn't God's plan yet. So I'm, because people have said to me too, even like, well, when you get married and have kids, you're going to stop doing, you're going to stop traveling and speaking. And I'm like, oh, did God tell you his plan for my life? <laughs> like, no, I'm going to do what God calls me to do. And yes, actually that has changed as I've had children and I've started traveling less and mm -hmm. because my family is the most important. Um, but I'm always going to do what God is. And I, that comes with discernment. That comes with prayer. That comes with my husband and I are discerned together. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I totally just forgot what we were. <laughs> okay, yeah, the, the, the dating, pool, yeah. the dating pool. I'm always like, if God is calling you to get married young, do it. But 
we love to be so black and white. We hate the discern, discerning. Yeah. The discernment part is doing God's will. Mm -hmm. So it's not just everybody get married young because I, I actually think that's a terrible idea because the divorce rate for people getting married young is 80%. Yeah. So you're, if you're called to get married young, like our beautiful friends at the Swaffords, they got married young. They got married when they were about 21, 22, mm -hmm. and they have a beautiful, because God called them to get married at that age. Yeah. You know, it's not just like this flippant, like, just go get, if I had gotten married at that age, I would be in a horrible relationship. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so my advice is not the feminists, like, go get your work, go do, go work, and then get married after you've done been successful. Because yeah. then it might be too late. Like, sure, it, you, sure. there are so many women who talk about that, like, I wish I would not have based my life around a career. Yeah. You know, so my thing is always you be a disciple, you you pray, you stay close to God and you will know God's will. The greatest thing we can do is to do God's will. Yeah. And that's going to look different for all of us. Um, so the whole dating thing, thankfully, we it only takes one person. Yeah. Right. It, you're not having to look for 10 people who are and you just sometimes you don't know God's plan. And maybe sometimes why I have friends who are like in their mid 40s, almost who are like. Where where is the guy? You sure. know where is he? So I I man I feel for the dating scene right now because it's rough. Yeah. It's rough to find that small pool of Catholics who are on fire, mm -hmm. but they're out there, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're around the world. Mm -hmm. Like I met my husband across the country, but I have a friend um, Emily mm -hmm. Wilson who her husband was across the world in the Netherlands. Wow. And so you just never know sometimes what God's gonna do. You know. Have you ever desired a deeper understanding of the life of Jesus? Check out The Extraordinary Story with Tom Hoops. This is The Extraordinary Story, a podcast about the life of Christ. Jesus Christ, God himself, entered the confusing maze that is our world to show us who we are and to give us his cross as a ladder up and out. This is his story and ours, The Extraordinary Story. The Extraordinary Story has been featured in The Loop, Alatea, Our Sunday Visitor, and Relevant Radio. You can listen to The Extraordinary Story on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And now, back to the show. Getting into that problem of over-sexualization, and, and you mentioned things like OnlyFans and social media. When it comes to young women, I mean, in the past three or four years, I think suicide rates have increased by like 30% in junior high girls. Yeah. And they associate a lot of that with social media and right. a lot of this stuff. And I think in large part because of this issue, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, already right, already as women, like it's the struggle of like, am, am I good enough? Mm -hmm. and, and I know some people who hate that, like you're enough, because truthfully it's like, we all fall short of the glory of God and we are only really enough in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so already we have those like issues of thinking like, oh, I don't measure up. I, and we compare ourselves to these other women. And then you go on social media and everyone's presenting their perfect self. Yes. And they could be a complete mess and disaster in real life. But we present this airbrush version of ourselves. And then, yeah, I can see like, yeah, I'm not good enough. And this almost this hopelessness, this despair. And, and it, I, it makes complete sense to me. But it's, it's super sad and that we just give social media like for us and our family we're like oh you're not having a phone you're not having a smartphone at least i know so like social media for a while you mm -hmm. know um and there's actually a movement of i have a friend who just started working with this movement that their goal is to get even college students to like in they're incentivizing them to go to dumb phones right yeah, to flip I've phones seen that, yeah. and it's like people are like thank god yeah. like please i i want to be free it's almost like um, Bobby and I gave a talk about pornography to a group of like 900 boys at a high school. Can you imagine that? That was, <laughs> whew, someone was like, that was like taking a pogo stick through a minefield, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, and the boys were like, it has been since I was eight years old that I've been looking at porn. I just want to be done with it. Like I'm so sick of it, but I can't stop. And I feel like that's even with social media. Mm -hmm. Like it's this addiction. And, and if you, what was the, um, the documentary, the social media documentary. Uh, the Social Dilemma. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, when you watch that, they're, they're essentially creating it so you become an addict. Mm -hmm. So it's like gambling. I mean, so they know how like when you, the instant like you drag and more stuff comes up, it's like a game becomes an addiction. Um, it, it's just like, I feel like young people are going to be like, please, like I can't give up social media, but like I need help. Yes. <laughs> you know, because it's creating all these other 
issues, again, the depression rates, the anxiety. The, I mean, I know I feel anxiety when I go mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel anxiety, and a lot of us feel anger. Like, mm -hmm. do I feel like there are certain apps, like Instagram creates like this, like comparison, so you feel maybe depression, anxiety, and <laughs> Twitter creates anger. Um, <laughs> you're like going, I'm like, I feel so angry. Like, just the things you see, you're like, oh, Lord have mercy. But uh, trying to grow in virtue, and I... I'm really grateful I didn't have this. Like mm -hmm. we didn't have this when we were in high school because even just the bullying, mm -hmm. the fear of being, the other thing I'm seeing with um, high schoolers is this fear and college, like this fear to speak up. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of being canceled. Yes. Oh my gosh, like we don't even want to say anything wrong because this is the, that's what's happened is people get canceled. And so like, I can't say anything wrong. I can't mess up. Like I can't, so I'm not even gonna take the chance yeah. of doing anything because I'm so afraid I might say something wrong. You know, so I, I just think social media is a very, you, it is possible to use it well, mm -hmm. but then you look at, like, it's not without its problems. It's not without yeah. all these other things. So I, as, as a parent, knowing these, knowing with pornography, knowing with, like, the depression rates, mm -hmm. knowing all this stuff, like, I'm, most of the parents that are ahead of us, like, 10 years, they didn't know all this stuff. Yeah. They just gave their kids phones in first grade, third grade. But you and I, like, as parents, like, we know, like, the statistics. We yep. know the stuff that like you give someone a smartphone, a kid a smartphone, and even if it doesn't have cellular, it has just internet, they have essentially every kind of horrific porn at mm -hmm. their fingertips. Mm -hmm. And kids shove it in, you know, like yep. they shove it in other kids' faces at the bus. Like, yep. Yep. I mean, I, I, I hear the stories because I'm in ministry and I just hear the stories from parents. I hear the stories from kids and it's like, oh my gosh. But so we, we know as parents, like a little bit more maybe how to wait. I'm actually really grateful all this stuff is out in the open. Yes. Right? It's like yes. back in the day, like parents maybe, they didn't talk to their kids about this stuff. They didn't talk to their kids about pornography. They didn't talk to their kids. A lot of them didn't talk to them about sex. They mm -hmm. didn't talk to about all this stuff. I'm actually really grateful this stuff is just really out there. Because yes. we all know we're going we're gonna to have to have these conversations with our kids. And I love, I love having conversations with my kids about everything. Yeah. And just like, you can come to me and ask me anything and I will tell you. Nothing is off the table. It's not shame. Like, we don't shame our kids about their body or sex. Like, they can ask, mom and dad are the, the we should be the experts, right? Mm -hmm. You can come to us with anything and ask us anything. It's, nothing is off limits, you know? Yeah. But I think it, my friend Kim always says, the devil over, always overplays his hand. Yeah. And he, he is overplaying his hand because now all this stuff is out there and it's like, what's happening now is like a generation of saints is being created, yeah. like as being formed Yes. because um, as I think Peter Kreeft said this, he was like, as the, the dark gets darker, the light gets brighter, Yeah. you know? So as the culture gets more and more really depraved and, and it's like, I, I didn't realize how depraved, like the depravity that was out there and on Twitter, I think I'm like, Oh Lord, like people just post like the Reddit yeah. things. You're like, Oh, did not know that even existed. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, as you kind of see the depths of depravity, like you realize like that's when saints are, are formed mm -hmm. is when the stuff gets getting, the culture gets crazier and crazier, which it is, you yeah. know, where our kids are going to be saints. Yeah. And they're going to be saints for our times, yeah. right? So they're not going to look like the reaction, right? No. So it's going to be people who are not necessarily only guarded from these things, but, but prepared for them. Right. 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 Um, and you want to hear a hot take, you know, I, I lean much more on kind of the libertarian side of things, but I think social media should be illegal for anyone under 18, just personally. Mm, yeah. um, and I granted, again, <laughs> I'm not a politician or whatever, but I just think that there, the statistics have shown it creates major health crises among young people. And it, yeah. it's also trusting a 16 year old who eventually is going to need to get a career with the idea of you're perfectly formed in your oh you know, amygdala and your front cortex to be able to make mm. the right decisions here. Yeah. No, you're not. And no. so you put something out there, it could ruin you. You know, at 16 Absolutely. years old. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so to give them free range, and that's just on yep. a practical side of things, not even on like the mental health side of mm -hmm. things. On the mental health side of things, I mean, just the suicide rates alone tell me we have yeah. a major national health crisis yep. here, as well as the addiction rates with pornography and stuff. Like, right. Right. It just seems silly to me that we wouldn't re be reacting in that way of like, clearly this is not good for us. Yeah. You know? And even at Bobby's old high school, um, all boy high school, they would have speakers come in and say, the things you post on social media are not go like in, in the future, when you are applying for a job, when you're applying for college, these people are going to be able to look at that. Yeah. So they just gave them a talk, like, just know that if you post it and these guys still do. 
It's like, hey, I just got drunk all the way. You're like, what are you thinking? Like, but they're not adult. They literally, their yep. brain is still being formed. They're still children. And so <laughs> you're right. Like we give, we, we treat them as children in a lot of other ways, like minors, mm-hmm. because their brain is not formed to deal with alcohol or voting. <laughs> you <know>? yeah, <laughs> they right. can't even vote. But you're right. Then they have access to social media where they're posting things that might affect them for their whole lives. Yes. That's very interesting. Yeah, and one of the things that I think about with my own kids in regard to this is I always think, because one of the things I deal with in regard to like the stress that it causes is I'm worried about something going on on literally the other side of the world, but I don't know my neighbors that well. Right. Like that's a major, major issue. And if yeah. that was happening to me at 12, 13, 14 years old, I don't know where my brain would be now, but yeah. I certainly would not be able to focus on community or those relationships of what we were talking about earlier of, yeah. I can't make friends because this is how I was formed to make friends is yeah. through these social media apps and stuff like that, which granted, I think social media has also done a lot of good things, right. but we need to be prepared for because the pendulum thing, right? Like social media got introduced to the culture. It went way out here. So what's that kind of like middle ground that we need to bring it back into? Yeah, you know? yeah. But speaking of all of that, um, one of the things I also wanted to talk to you about was influencer culture, uh, mm-hmm. especially with, with Catholic influencing and, and things like that. What's kind of your state of affairs, if you will, of like the, the current reality of, of Christian and Catholic influencers? Is it good for us to have these kind of like celebrity style things or is it potential dangers? What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you're talking to somebody, I hate social media. <laughs> I like, I'm like, oh, and, and especially I'm a mom of five kids. I homeschool. It's like, oh man, like social media is just a time suck. Sure. How, so, okay. So social media can be used for such good. And the people that I know that are are influencers and don't want to be, I like. I mean, I like those people. Like, I'm not. Tr- they're not trying to be a celebrity. Maybe mm-hmm. they are. Just they're well known because they're good at what they do mm-hmm. and they're a beautiful example. So like people like a Father Mike Schmitz, I love him. He's not even on. He's not really on even on. He's not trying to be an influencer. He's not trying to be a celebrity. In fact, he. It's really hard. Like it's not. He doesn't love it because it's like he. He just loves Jesus, yeah. you know, and he loves being the campus minister or the chaplain at the the, the university that he's at. He loves the, the people who, who are there and um, and hates being called like a celebrity. You yeah. know what I mean? So I love when people like, like I don't want to be a celebrity, I hate, but they're doing such beautiful things. They become well sure. known. Right. And then, yeah. And then you have the Catholics who are like. Which, which is the young, young, the youths, <laughs> the, the youths. Like right now, it used to be, you know, kids want to be doctors, they want to be mm-hmm. lawyers. It's like now they want to be a, a YouTube celebrity, mm-hmm. right? YouTube famous. They want to be Instagram famous, and it's like that shouldn't be the goal of life. I mean, sure, right. it's it's not bad, and it's great to be an influencer. The hard part is that we know <laughs> is that you get more likes and you get more followers, the more um, angry you are, mm-hmm. the more outlandish you are, and it that creates that equals money. Yes. So instead of being very um, in the middle, in the way of virtue, we get very polarized. I mean, and this is what I've seen even in the Catholic world that sometimes influencers. I'm like, what happened to this person? I I used to be friends with. I was friends with this person. This person became very angry and they became very because like, well, that equals more followers. It equals more likes and it equals more money which is very sad. And so it's like, I feel like as a, as a disciple, I, man, it's like you kind of, you do want to kind of just shut it all off and go I'm live sure. in a monastery. <laughs> and I'm like, but to use it well, to use it for God's glory, not for my glory, you know, not for our glory. Um, to me, that's always the balance, the, the fine line you're, you're walking. It's like, even when you get more followers, even if you get a million followers, that it's not about, you, but it's always about glorifying God. Mm -hmm. And man, the selfie culture, the narcissism, Mm -hmm. I mean, that you just see, I see the narcissism growing, right? And because if it is all about me, myself, and even me, the vanity, it's like, oh Lord, but it's just just a very, it's, if you want to be a disciple and you want to be evangelizing, there's a very fine line because you and I have both seen people go try to be like, want to be influencers for good. And you see if they get captivated by the money, they get Mm -hmm. captivated by the followers and the likes, it leads down a not great path, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so that, that's the fine line. We need more people to be the light, 
even in the darkness of TikTok, even in the darkness of Instagram, whatever it is, in the darkness of Twitter. Yeah. And I love the people who are a light. I'm like, thank you for being, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I probably have to get over myself, like, like oh, you, you, maybe you should, like for me, I'm like, maybe you should show, like, I hate Instagram, but it's like, okay, it, maybe I should be like, hey, like, here are some beautiful, good, true things, like, mm -hmm. as a, because the culture hates is hating on parent like parenthood right mm -hmm. now right the, like i just read an article from 2017 it was like maybe you saw it but it was like a mainstream new york times or something or cbs whatever it was essentially like having children is a moral like a problem like uh, okay and i was like oh really okay whereas you and i know like having children is a blessing and a yeah, gift yeah. and actually we're not in an overpopulation climate crisis we're actually we are not replacing ourselves yeah. enough like our, our birth rates are so bad that this is going to be a problem for our economy, for our cult. Like it's going to be bad mm -hmm. if we don't replace ourselves and if we don't have children. So I'm, we are doing our part. We are trying. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I, so I'm like, maybe people need to hear like being a mother is a beautiful thing, but it is difficult. Mm -hmm. Anything worth doing has sacrifice and is difficult because all you have is children are a burden or you also have like, Children are magical beauty. It's like, there's a middle. <laughs> it is one of the most difficult things you will ever do mm -hmm. is having a kids, having a family, but it is the most beautiful thing. It's like, that's what Catholic, it's the both and. Yeah. Like anything worth doing is we're gonna require sacrifice. The cost of discipleship, mm -hmm. right? Like discipleship is hard, but it is the most beautiful thing that you could do with your life because yeah. God is the most, you know, it's like our, our whole lives are made for God to praise them for his praise and glory. So, but it's not easy. Yeah. Being a disciple is not easy. So even though I'm like, I, I hate social media, I'm like, but there also needs to be people who are showing the beauty of a family, the, the beauty of just like yeah. the normal, you're not presenting this like perfect, like, Oh, everything's perfect. <laughs> Although I'm not going to like be like live streaming me and Bobby, like arguing, you know sure. what I'm saying? Like, Hey, here's our latest fight, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's always one of those matters of similar to what we were saying earlier of constant discernment, right? Yes, of what yes. what good is is happening out of this, and what good is it coming for me? Because um, if you're going to go into that world, you really need a, a solid spiritual director. You need a consistent discernment of like, what am I trying to accomplish here? Yeah. Um, even if you're trying to make a career out of it, fine. But you need to understand like there are spiritual dangers here sometimes that you Absolutely. need to be aware of. And so sometimes money can end up drawing you into those spiritual dangers. And again, we need good Catholics out there yes. on, sa on social media. Um, yeah. But consistently, because I mean, <laughs> you go on Catholic Twitter right now and it is like, find out which camp you're a part of. And there's like 12 of them to choose from and all of them are mad at each other. And So divisive. And, exactly. And which if I was is not of the, the Holy church, Spirit. <laughs> exactly. Not of the Holy Spirit at all. Yeah. If I was coming into the church and that was what I was yeah. experiencing, I would have a very confusing feeling of like, wait a minute, I thought this was about unity. I thought this was about Christ. And this yeah. is more about hot takes and opinions about different, of yeah. varying things. Um, and granted, there are, you know, things to have opinions about, but it just is like, what are we presenting yeah. to the world uh, here? Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So another thing that um, I've attended a few talks of yours actually about being attuned to the Holy Spirit, because I think that is kind of a string that we've been talking about since the beginning here of discernment, you know, being aware, open to these things. Um, what really kind of sparked your passion about that part of the spiritual life? Yeah. I, it's funny, you know, as Catholics, the Holy Spirit normally is the, the person, the Trinity that we have the kind of maybe the not his best relationship with sure. out of all we're like oh father okay got that jesus got got to jesus you know but holy spirit we're like Ugh. i think it's because so often we are control freaks and we want to control mm. everything and the holy spirit's like mm -mm, sorry <laughs> we live and move and have our being in the holy spirit and the holy spirit you you can't control him he's wild yeah. well yeah you can't tame the holy <laughs> spirit and so people i think are afraid because we are control freaks and we want to control i mean that's an, a lady who was like, I did a women's conference and she was, the, the, most of the women were like over 50, mm -hmm. you know, between 50 and 80. And this one woman said like, what does it mean to have a conversion? And I was like, uh, that's a good question. I was like, I think it just means surrendering everything to God and saying, Jesus, I trust in you. And because we want to hold everything so we... We, like, I want to control my money. I want to control my, my vocation, my life, this, this, this. And it's like, sometimes that con a conversion is really surrendering it all to God and saying, God, I give everything to you. Like, I can't do this on my own. And Dr. Bob Schutz, who I love, um, 
he calls it unholy self-reliance. Mm. Like when we have an un, self-reliance isn't bad, but an unholy self-reliance is I can do everything and I don't need God. Mm. And the truth is like, you can do nothing without God. Like we need him. Um, and, and then to be in tune with the Holy Spirit, to live a life in the Holy Spirit is really a life of like letting go, of, yeah. <laughs> letting go of control. And my, one of my favorite prayers is come Holy Spirit. We, okay, you and I did a conference together where I gave a talk about the Holy Spirit. It was so great. The next day, a guy came up to me because I was sharing about the spiritual gifts and I was sharing stories about praying with people and like healing and just the, the different charisms that are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I was kind of going through them and sharing stories of priests I know who have, and just lay people I know who have charisms of healing, charisms of gifts of knowledge, you know, wisdom, faith, all these different charisms of the Holy Spirit. And this man came up to me the next day and he said, Jackie, I was at your talk and I listened to her. He's like, I am 54 years old and I have never had an experience like I had last night. Wow. He said, I was at the hotel bar with my wife. We were watching the football game. And he said, a guy said like, hey, what are all these people doing at this conference? And he's like, oh, it's like a, it's a, it's a Catholic conference about evangelization. And, and he goes, oh, I was raised Catholic, but... And the guy that was at my talk, I said, when you have those experiences, in that moment, just pray the prayer, come Holy Spirit. And he said, I said it for the first, he's like, I've never done that. He said, but I said, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. Give me the words to say, like direct this conversation, come Holy Spirit. He said, and I can't tell you, I've never had this happen in my life. He said, so what happened is we start talking more and, and he's like, yeah, and maybe this guy had a couple drinks, you know, sure. <laughs> he's sharing a little more. He's like an hour into the conversation, his wife is like, okay, honey, I'm getting tired. I'm going up to the room and you keep talking to this dude. And he just, the guy started opening up, becoming vulnerable with this wow. Catholic man. And he's like, he just shared his heart with me. And I, I was just able to listen and really just share my own faith. And he said later that the, at the end of the conversation, the guy was like, I've never shared this with anybody. He's like, can I have your number? You know? Wow, wow. <laughs> and he said, I am 54 and have never had that happen. And it was like a simple prayer of come Holy Spirit yeah. can change everything. Because I share my own stories like in an Uber saying yeah. come Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I have some, I have plain stories, Uber stories of like just saying, like you have someone say something to you like, oh, what do you do for a living? Like, I'm a Catholic speaker or whatever. And they're like, oh, well, they either hate you in that moment or whatever. They're like, yeah. they, they were raised Catholic and they yeah. hate the Catholic church or, or they're like, really? You know, you actually look happy you know? yeah. <laughs> like, and you're Catholic. <laughs> do you know Jesus? Like, yes, I do. Um, or at one time a guy was like on a plane and he was like, what do you speak about? And I'm like, well, let me give you my talk on chastity. <laughs> no, and I'm, I'm just kidding. But in those moments I say, come Holy Spirit. Yeah. And to see those what I call the turn, and this happens every time, the turn in the conversation is where that person, like the walls break down mm -hmm. and they start becoming vulnerable. It is incredible to watch. And you see like God, the conversion happening, like God, the Holy Spirit is working in that person. You see the walls come down and the, the vulnerability. It is amazing. And I'm like, God, you are so good. God, but I'm always like, and even when I'm in those places, I'm like, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because even as they're talking, I'm like, Holy Spirit, I don't know what to say right now. But you said you'd give me the word. So I'm just, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And um, yeah, you can't control the Holy Spirit. And so we have to listen to yeah. him. Like when, it, there are times when I'm giving a talk and I, I, I feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit, like you need to say this. And I'm like, really? Because I kind of don't want to talk about that right now. Or, yeah. like, or like one time I was speaking, they're like, you need to mention the part of your conversion about contraception. And I'm mm. like, really? To this group, are you sure about that? Like they may turn on me, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, but I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna obey the Lord, you know? And so it is so important that we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We speak to, with the Holy Spirit and that we like listen, you know, we discern, um, we discern what, what's happening or that maybe sometimes the people we're with. Mm -hmm. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Charism is discernment of spirits. And I tell teens, I was like, here's the deal. I was like, a lot of you, when you encounter people, you all kind of, if you're living a life in the Holy Spirit, there's a discernment. When you meet someone, there's sometimes you feel like a weird, like there's something sure. not right about this person. Like there's something not right. And I was like, you need to listen to that. That there, there's just some, and then I've had people like actually see angels, see demons, see, I, I, I ask for Mary to be with me when I speak. I'm like, Mama Mary, wrap me in your mantle. And I say, Hail Mary, like Mama Mary be with me. And I've had teenagers at high schools, 
uh, different times. One one time, a girl said, "I saw Mary next to you while you were speaking," mm. and I was like, "Mary, you're awesome," you know. <laughs> and then one time, I had they were like, "I saw blue around you." Mm. I was like, that's a discernment, of, like a gift of discernment of spirits. And then one time this group of girls in the front, they were like, we smelled roses when you were speaking. And I was like, that's Mary. You know, so it was just like cool things like that. Um, I feel like as you get more in tune with the Holy Spirit, it just, you start experiencing more beautiful, like this is not just like for like, oh, only the great saints can only do, have like mystical. It's like, no, we are all called to be little mystics. Yes. And just in the sense of like always listening to the Lord, like maybe you're getting a word for someone you're speaking to or like you get an image for them and you're like, what is this? Do I say this? Like, or prompting of praying with somebody for mm -hmm. healing, which I've, I don't have a dominant charism of healing, but there have been people I have prayed with and they have been healed physically. And so it may not happen all the time, but I had a friend convict me like, Jackie, if there were nine, if there were a hundred people in a wheelchair, and you prayed over all a hundred of them and only one was healed, would you do it again? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> for the one, maybe sure. the one that's gonna walk that day. So it's just beautiful to have a community of people who are in tune with the Holy, who have a life in the Holy Spirit, who listen to God. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just have so many stories of friends who were like, yeah, I pulled over the side of the road because God told me to, and I prayed over this man and his cancer was healed. Wow. Like, what? You know, <laughs> like just, and I've had friends who've prayed over people who's, like were blind and their sight was restored. Wow. And these are like 20 year olds, 20 something year olds who are just listening to the voice of God. And so I, I listen to these ridiculous divisions in the Catholic church. And I'm like, you guys, we are fighting about these things. And yet you are not, we are not creating disciples. We're not raising the dead and healing the sick. Like Jesus yeah. asked us to like, oh man. Yeah. We get <laughs> so focused on such ridiculous, like division and sometimes they are important sure, things to sure. talk about in the liturgy and the, of course obviously like I love the liturgy um and but if we're not also going out to the culture and evangelizing the culture and loving people and bringing people to Jesus then that's a problem yeah you know so yeah and one of the things that I've always been fascinated with when it comes to the charismatic movement but then also some of the people trying to really attune themselves into the Holy Spirit is that it, it, and again it goes back to some of what we said before about the kind of great hall of saints the you know that all of them expressed what that means in their own way yep. in my experience it's always been this the still small voice that's sometimes very difficult to hear yeah. and but I hear that in the writings of St. Benedict right being here at Benedict in college talking right. about that um, it's always been much more of a because of I have had some experiences like that but much more just relaxed and, and calm and Every time, though, it's a feeling of calm, peace. You know, with yeah. that man in the bar that we were talking about, like the peace that came over him to be able to have this conversation mm -hmm. is what that actually was, right? right? And so it, for our listeners, it's, it's one of those things of if you're trying to get into that, what that means for you might look very different than the Absolutely. person literally sitting next to you in the pew. So, and that's okay. You know, that's what and God wants to do. St. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 12. Yes. He says, not all of you are an arm, you know, like, or an eye, like, don't be jealous of, like, some of you are an armpit, and that's exactly. great, you know, no, I'm just kidding, um, but, like, we are the, he, right before those charisms, he talks about, like, we are, the, as the body of Christ, we are all parts of the body, and we are going to all have different functions, mm -hmm. so, while you may not have a, like, a predominant charism of healing, you have a charism of teaching, mm -hmm which is a charism. And, right. and I tell, I talk to the teens and young adults about like, what's the difference between a natural gift and a supernatural gift? You mm -hmm. can have a natural gift, but grace builds upon nature. Yeah. So God will use your natural gifts. Like for me, I have been on stage since I was five. My, we've been in musicals, my family, been, I've been singing in front of people since I was a very young age. So I'm not afraid of a crowd. Like I, I can speak in front of 20,000 people and I'm not, I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. Like I'm not nervous. <laughs> and some people would rather die. Yeah. They would rather be in a coffin yes. than speak in front of people. And I'm like, this is just my nature. And God is like, well, I'm gonna use that for my glory. Mm -hmm. So I'm, his grace is gonna build upon my nature and, and go from being a natural talent to a supernatural gift, mm -hmm. right? A natural, gift is just like you can entertain people mm -hmm. and some people are great entertainers but a supernatural gift is one where you bring people to jesus mm -hmm. so you could have a natural gift of teaching which is great but if you have a supernatural gift of teaching you're gonna people's hearts are gonna be converted yeah. to jesus which my husband has a gift of te a charism of teaching as well and young men in his classroom would be like mr angel like i grew closer to jesus because of this class that's awesome 
you know? So, yeah. so we are all needed and we all have different charisms. That's why when we become so, the only word I can think of is myopic. When we come, become so narrow minded of what it means to be a man and a woman instead of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, mm. I think we are really limiting, like, you don't, we don't know what God's plan for this person is because they have different charisms that they've been given at baptism, yeah. right? By the Holy Spirit that they're supposed to use for the kingdom. Yeah. And maybe that means preaching, you know, like me, I'm a stay at home mom, I homeschool, but I also go out and I, I preach. Mm -hmm. It's almost funny because I feel some Catholics become more fundamentalist Protestants, yeah. like Baptist, I'm like, whereas like women can't speak, you cannot, you know, like all this stuff, like, I'm like, it's weird that some of these Catholics are becoming more Protestant than they are Catholic by do, by saying these things. And instead of the Catholic, thank God we are Catholic, thank you, Lord, like the beauty of our, the teaching of our church and what we believe about, again, the, the body of Christ is so beautiful and we are all so different and meant, we're all meant to build up the body of Christ and only you can discern what that looks like because you, God has given you those those charisms. Well, I'm into that. Yeah. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. As always, yeah. it's wonderful to have a discussion with you. So much thank insight and, and great stuff there. So for all of our listeners, um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and be sure to tune in next time. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the Benedictine Dialogues, a production of Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. To catch all the latest and support our growing platform, visit media.benedictine.edu. And be sure to recommend this show to your friends and family. Help us to transform culture in America, one conversation at a time.